The Halifax Moose said through the news, Connor McDavid's in the news, and baseball rule changes are the news. All that and more at Sports Corn TV. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Sports Corn TV. Chris Dobson, Jerry Green in your living room and on your computers and on your phones. Jerry, we've got a great episode tuned up here tonight. Yeah, that's it. Eh? We got a huge episode tonight. Uh, starting off with the big news, of course, out of Halifax, media press conference called Bobby Smith, 20-year shareholder for Montreal Canadian, has sold his interest in the Halifax mm-hmm. Mooseheads, which to me I find interesting to think about today because the Halifax Mooseheads are on a championship run potentially right now. And you figured, you know, with about a third of the season left to go, yeah. today's the day you make the announcement. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. You know, we're not privy to the newspapers. I don't read the newspapers in Halifax all the time. Was this something that was uh, very sudden? Did Was there any inkling that he was in discussions with anybody? I don't know. Don't think so. Um, I don't think anybody heard that stuff. Right. So he, he's been the ownership there for a long time. On a, on a franchise, it's, you know, only second in attendance to Quebec City because Quebec City has the bigger rink. I think... Uh, uh, the, the Mooseheads are very well supported in the city of, of Moncton or uh, Halifax rather. And, and, you know, it's, um, he's 65 years old, Chris. Um, but you know, owners can be older than 65. It's not like he, you know, he's been retired for many years. He was a number one draft pick. If you remember back in the day with, uh, right. the Minnesota North stars, the Minnesota North stars and won the Calder cup. He, he's, he spent a lot of time with your Montreal Canadians. Um, you know, but it was just a surprise, you know, what's his next venture? This seemed like a lot of fun, kept him close to hockey, and now he's not. Right, and, you know, what's interesting to note, too, is the group that he sold the team to, the, the, the team was sold majority over to Sam Simon, who runs the Simon Group Holdings. They're out of Michigan, which has really got a, got a, a few people up in arms right now, and I think everyone just needs to calm down. Uh, there's nothing specific. I saw a great quote from, the, from Sam uh, basically saying that, you know, Bobby's going to stay on board throughout this transition over the next couple of years. This isn't something they're just going to take over. I think everybody's instant panic was, or what are they going to do? Are they going to, are they going to move the team? Are they going to move? No, everybody calm down. The Mooseheads, like Jerry said, are the second most well-supported team in the queue. I would be hard pressed to think that that's what was going to happen. Although I will admit uh, when they made the, said that there was an announcement coming, I thought they were going to say that there's a new downtown rink getting built. But boy, what, what a turn of events that was. There'd be a lot of red tape, Chris, for him to move the franchise, in, in bottom line. So uh, what people need your reaction to it, uh, you know, calm down. Right. All right. Let's move on. Uh, Bathurst. We got to talk about this because this is a real head scratcher for me. The, the worst team in the league. And based off the junior, the junior hockey rebuild cycle, 2018, they won a Memorial Cup. Shouldn't they be back to great by now? Or is this just, I mean, it's, we're going on what, five years now? There's a couple of things that come to mind for me for the Bathurst Titan, uh, the Acadie Bathurst Titan for me, Chris. Is number one, the, remember when they, they had a coach from Ontario? Do you remember his name, Chris? Um, coach and general manager from Ontario, and he left to go to be an assistant coach in the AHL. It seemed like he had a pipeline to players in the OHL. Mm-hmm. And he looked like he seemed like he was a good coach. He had them in a, a 40 wins that season. Uh, that, I'm talking about last season. Last yeah. season, he took this job in the off season, and uh, seemed to have a pipeline there. Seemed to do good with his drafts. But the other problem that I saw that cropped up last year um, for the Titan was Cole Huckins. That whole Cole Huckins thing, and then Huckins gets traded to Sherbrooke for just a second round pick, and he's having a great season there. He's a draft pick of the Calgary Flames. There was no reason to give him away. And then, of course, this year they start the season without Bedner. Uh, who is their number one goaltender, whether or not he was coming back or not from the Detroit training camp is here or there. They, then they, they decide, well, the the start we got off to, we're going to trade, you know, kidney and and Melanson and kidney Melanson, two great players that, uh, you know, I remember when, when Bathurst traded for Melanson from the Quebec rampire and they said, ah, this, this guy, you know, not great numbers there as a rookie. And he was a first round pick and, and he came to Bathurst, and what a dynamic player he is, and drafted by the Seattle Kraken and, and playing tremendous uh, there in uh, Sherbrooke, and Kidney's playing great in Gatineau. So, um, 
you know, it seems like they're in flux a little bit. You know, you have Gordy Dwyer there now as the head coach and general manager, and uh, there's too much change going on. Maybe that's the reason why they find themselves near the bottom. No, I, I, you know, it's, it's funny. It's kind of exactly how I looked at it. As I looked at the turnover from, you know, the bench boss, the GM, everything was kind of going on in Bathurst. And, you know, I wanted to give them a little lackadaisical slide because, you know, but unfortunately you're right. They were good just a year ago, two years ago. Like they were a good hockey team. They just unfortunately were beat by better hockey teams, even in the Maritime Division. You know, they were they were outranked. Charlottetown was really good. St. John was a Memorial Cup team. Halifax yep. has always been a thorn in their side. So overall, I agree with you. I don't think it's anything that people need to panic about, but I'll tell you, if they don't turn the ship around soon, fans are going to speak up. And it's every time that, you know, every time the fans get involved at Bathurst, you just never want to hear it. I hope everything works out well there, but everyone just needs to calm down again. I think they're going to be fine. Uh, let's stick with hockey with change leagues. We're going to start with the NHL. We can't stop talk with the NHL without talking about Connor McDavid. Now up to 105 points on the season. Now the fifth fastest player to put up 800 points in NHL history of 545 games. What do you make of the phenom that is Connor McDavid? That type of statistic kind of blows my mind a little bit in regards to people keeping track of that sort of thing. <laughs> Who's the quickest one to get to uh, 800 uh, points? Um, he is a fascinating player. And I saw the highlights the other night. He scored two goals and really didn't have to do much. He can have a bad night and score two goals, even though one was in an empty net. The other one, he banks in off somebody. And that's the way great players are able to elevate their game if they're not even having a, a great game. But Chris, it all comes down, you know, any sort of legacy that Connor McDavid's ever going to have has to come down to winning. And the, the winning means nice. championships. Winning means moving on in the playoffs. You know, I was looking back and, and when uh, Sid first hit the, uh, hit the scene, um, he won a cup in his third season, 2009. In his third season, has won two since in 16 and 17. Ovechkin took a little while. He didn't get one until 2018, but he did get one. And maybe you could say that about Connor McDavid. Ovechkin always classified as a great player, great goal scorer. But, you know, he was it was only uh, 2018, which was technically five years ago, that he got it. And he's been in the, in the league, what is he, 37 now? So it was 32 before he even got a cup. So, you know, I know you're measured that way. Will it come eventually? Could he win them in bunches? I don't know if he can do that in Edmonton. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I don't think he can. Uh, in fact, this trade deadline upcoming this season will probably be the telltale sign of what the Edmonton Oilers are capable of. Um, Cause right now they're sliding. I think they're sitting just outside a playoff spot right now. Uh, I do agree with you on the side of things, but where I find the difference comes in here to me is if you look at the Leafs, if you look at Edmonton, if you look at, you know, everybody else who's done it right, they're spending so much money on their star players. Sid took his contract. Do you remember when his, when his entry-level contract was up, Jerry? He took an $8.7 million deal. Didn't sign 11, didn't sign $13 million. Mm -hmm. He had the players built around him. Everything was about him, Malkin, and Latang, And everybody else was surrounding, and it all worked out. Yeah. So for me right now, if Connor McDavid doesn't win a title here in the next two to three years – you have to think that he's going to ask the franchise to do what's best for them and move him someplace where they can rebuild properly. Although I think, I, excuse me, I can't use the word Oilers and rebuild properly in the same sentence because they've had so many opportunities to do this right. And they folded either way. I hope they get it done. And I hope a big name, i.e. like an Eric Carlson or something like that shows up in their roster, the trade deadline. I think that'll help. Yeah. Well, after you see what Toronto did in getting, uh, you know, Ryan O'Reilly and, and, uh, and right. he's a great player and a con Smythe guy and, uh, 32 years old, so he's joining a... Scored his first hat trick this week with the Leafs. 30s. Um, does he still have... I know. Does he still have what they need? I think he's uh, energized by being switched over to Toronto. Will that be enough? They still have some goaltending uh, question marks in, in their net. So, um, But I'm totally impressed with Toronto being in Dubas, being able to get... Ryan O'Reilly and how does he fit in? And I still don't know the technical points of who's going to have to be moved somewhere to have room to pay for Riley and, and O'Reilly and, and whether or not Matt Murray comes back and what has to happen. That's the juggling of the balls that has to happen. But the fact that you have Ryan O'Reilly, um, uh, that's going to have a huge impact. Is it enough to get by Tampa is the question mark. But I was totally impressed that they were able to do something and do it early. Look, Ryan O'Reilly, and I, it kills me to admit this, 
Ryan O'Reilly is one of the exact key pieces the Toronto Maple Leafs need. He's a former captain. He's got a Stanley Cup. He came on in. He's doing what he had. In fact, his first game when they played the Habs, they had actually moved John Tavares to his wing. So they moved Tavares up there. Now, as far as cap space goes, other news that came out of Toronto uh, early this week, they have officially shut down Jake Muzzin for the rest of the season. So, you know, I don't know from an LTIR perspective if that cap space will help free up some opportunity there. Uh, but overall, if you look at the moves Toronto's made, that was a huge one. And they got it done early before the deadline even came into play. And Ryan O'Reilly didn't miss a beat. He was traded the next day. He said, I'm not missing a game to play the Habs. He was traded Friday, Saturday night. He was in the lineup and he said, I wasn't going to miss it. Huge acquisition for Dubas. Dubas knows his butts on the line right now. And you're right. They're going to play Tampa in the first round. At this point, they're just trying to figure out where they're playing in Toronto, where they're playing in Tampa to start this thing off. I don't know if it's going to be enough because Tampa's yeah. going to add at the deadline. You best believe that's going to happen. But overall, and, I, I don't, I don't know. And no disrespect to uh, your Montreal Canadiens, uh, Chris, but they were thrown into a wolves den with Riley's first game is against Montreal. And then of course the Toronto media eat up the fact that Toronto goes into Buffalo and eats up Buffalo again. They jump at any opportunity to, to get that bandwagon rolling for the Toronto Maple Leafs. I'm talking about the Toronto media. So we'll see what happens later on in some, because they've lost against some bad teams all season long. So there's still a lot to be proven by this Toronto Maple Leaf team going down the stretch of whatever 25 games uh, left on the schedule, 20 games left on the schedule in the NHL. Well, you know what? We're going to keep our eyes tuned to it because the trade deadline's on March 3rd, so you best believe we'll have all sorts of updates, yes. but, but we'll keep our eyes at that. Jerry, we got to talk about the Scott Tournament of Hearts, the Scotties. If you've been paying attention, I'm sure you got thoughts and opinions. Paying attention? Can you see the bags under my eyes? I have to stay up late at night. I don't get to watch the games the next morning, but uh, it's nice that for that older generation that loves curling, can't stay up till 1 o'clock at night watching curling. <laughs> But TSN replays it the next day, which is nice of them. Thank you very much. My mother appreciates that. But here's an old-timer leading the way again, Chris. 48-year-old, 48-year-old Jennifer Jones is playing with a bunch of 20-somethings on her team. She's revamped her team. Uh, Caitlin Laws uh, is moved on to another team, and, and she has another team that's, that's good too, Manitoba team. But here she has the young kids, and she's on top of the standings again. And another Manitoban in Carrie Arneson. She's cruising along. She's going for her fourth straight Tournament of Hearts Championship, Chris. You know who's done it four straight times? Maritimer Colleen Jones has won it four straight times. You remember, about, you forget about the dominance of Colleen Jones back in the day and how uh, proud Nova Scotia must have been of her and the Maritimes must have been of her for that accomplishment. So Arneson still undefeated and still going after her fourth uh, tournament of hearts. Andrea Kelly had a bad start, Chris, and she's of course representing New Brunswick from the capital winter club, uh, winter club in Fredericton. I had early struggles. She needs to get to the top three. She has three losses. Now she can't afford anymore to get into the top three. Cause that's what happens. That starts the playoff round this weekend. The top three from each division are going to play off in events and then the bad news is the final is sunday night at 10 o'clock atlantic time from kamloops there's no which if ands or buts that's when it's going to be so if you can't stay up to watch it which is a two and a half hour event chris takes you right till till 12 30 can't stay up and watch it are you going to try to avoid any sort of media information to watch it the next <laughs> morning well the next morning's a monday morning most people have to go to work but again uh, I uh, always look forward to this uh, time of year. And then right after that, the briar starts the next following Friday. So curling is always great to start uh, late February and early March has always been good. Well, let me ask you this then, because the past couple of years, they've added more wildcard teams. Do you like that they have more teams in the tournament? Yes, I love the two divisions and uh, it makes it a lot more fun because Chris, it gives some of the um, like uh, Northwest Territories got off to a great start. They were three and one and I think they've settled down to about 500 now, but it gives them an opportunity to be in the top three. And you don't have, you know, uh, uh, it would be the six other teams in the other division. You don't have to go against Arneson and all the other ones to get near the top. You could be in the top three as a, as a smaller province. And so I really do like the fact that they get the wild card and the two divisions. Okay, so let's move on to baseball because I want to talk about the new rules that are being implemented. And there's a couple doozies out here. We're going to start right away. Number one, between pitches, there's going to be a 15-second timer 
with the bases empty and a 20 second timer with a runner on base. At last check, the pitch timer had reduced the average time of an MLB game by 26 minutes. I would think this is massive, man. Like, imagine shading 30 minutes off a ball game. I'm sure you're pumped about it. I look at Chris. I am tired of watching a Sunday night game, especially uh, your your Red Sox and the Yankees. It's an over three hour event. I mean, baseball is. I love baseball, but it has some downtime, especially watching it on TV, Chris. If I'm at the ballpark, I'm distracted by watching this guy over here. I'm watching, getting a beer here. I can go get a dog, whatever the case may be. But three hours is way too long. If they can short every other game, think about it, Chris. Um, Football maybe is two and a half, close to three. Uh, Hockey's definitely under two and a half. Uh, Basketball's under two and a half. I mean, your, your attention span is only so much. And, and baseball is trying this, and I appreciate it. Okay, so just so we're clear, too, on that side, pitchers who do violate the timer, they will be charged with yeah. an automatic ball. So just so everybody knows that. Number two, they ban the shift officially. Uh, I have an issue with this. I think it's foolish. I figured the only way – anyways, bottom line is it's a new rule change. I don't like it. That's the one that annoys me the most. But the one that's really intriguing to me is the bases. They've increased the base size. And by base size, I just mean first, second, and third. Home plate was left untouched. But they're going to be three inches closer from first to second, from second to third. But if you think about it from both base sides, that's six inches on either side. So those guys sliding into second or sliding into third, they might have been out last year at safe this year. Yeah, you remember in in, the... Little league, they'd make two bags. They'd have an orange bag here for the first baseman and the white bag on the other side. It's kind of a, a similar to that. And, it, and and part of the idea of enlarging the bag was to protect the first baseman and any sort of collision that might happen there to keep them right. farther apart from each other and giving the runner a lot more base to run to. But Chris, with the shift and the bag, with the shift being eliminated and the bag becoming bigger, you can't tell me there's not going to be a lot more running. There's going to be a lot more offense. And I love when the runners are running the bases and, and plays have to be made either to pick them off or to shut them down or if a play goes into center field and you got to try to get them at third. That's action that I want. I want action all the time. And the bag and the non-shift is going to create that. Where you it, it, Look at, tip your hat to the creator of, you know, hey, look at, I know this batter hits to this side all the time. We're putting three guys over there. I tip their hat to the innovation, but I like it back to where it was. I want more offense and not more runs. Pers- I want action. I want action. Fully get it. I look at it from a perspective of and go, okay, athletes are better now than they've ever been. Sports science has completely changed. Athletes are bigger. They're faster. They're stronger. So let's, I don't know, them increasing the base size. The one thing I will tell you though, one thing I'm excited about is, you know, with that pitch timer, with everything going on, if you don't think for two seconds yeah. that the fans are going to be screaming and counting down and try to mess with the pitcher during that pitch count, I would think you're going to be absolutely shocked. You know, as somebody who loves watching fans be able to interact more. Look, baseball does a great job there, but overall, <laughs> I, I know the rule change is not for me, but hey, it is what it is, and we'll see exactly how the whole thing pans out. All right, Jerry, let's wrap it up. It's time for the wrap, and we're going to start where we always start. That is, of course, AUS hockey playoffs are underway. How are things looking so far? Give me an update. Well, the first round on the men's and women's has been completed, Chris, and an upset to report is the UDM Aigle Le Bleu upset UPEI in the first round. The first round's just a best of three. Moncton won in PEI, then lost home Saturday night, had to go PEI, and they won in overtime four to three. So the good news is they won. The bad news is they have to face the number one seed uh, the University, uh, UNB rather, and that would start on uh, Friday at the Aiken Center. It's a best of five. They're going to play Friday and Saturday at the Aiken Center in the next round, the semifinal round on the men's side. The other uh, matchup has Acadia meeting uh, St. Mary's Huskies, and that is also as the uh, Acadia swept through St. FX in two straight games in that best of three. On the ladies' side, St. Mary's it will meet UPI. They've advanced to the semifinals. Moncton got knocked out there. And uh, St. Mary's is going to take on St. FX. Um, and UPI, rather, is going to take on UMB. And St. Mary's is going to take on St. FX. I've got it straight. Anyways, there's still great AUS hockey to be seen in and around the province of New Brunswick. 
Chris Tiger Woods was on the course all weekend. How do you do? Overall, I'll tell you this. One, no, he did not win the Genesis Invitational as we talked about it. Uh, although he did make the cut, which was great to see, but he didn't top, crack the top 40. You know, when he closed his final round at two over with a 73. Did finish the tournament at one under, though, still double digits off what would have been the winner. What I did find interesting and what I like to see is that, you know, you look at the small wins that come with Tiger Woods on this, Jerry, and that is one. He walked all four days. He made the cut. He even had an eagle at one point. There are times, you know, he got to golf a little bit with his buddies um, and to see exactly how that did. I hope they pair him up with, uh, with with Rory and the boys every time that he's moving forward. He does say after the fact that he is hoping he's going to cut his golf time down but wants to play every major of the year so he's able to do it. Either way, it was good to see Tiger Woods back. The crowds were there to see him. The fans were out in full support. He made it all four rounds. You said he wouldn't make the cut. You said he wouldn't even finish the round. Overall, I'm pumped with it. That's exactly how Tiger Woods did. Look, he, I'm pretty, I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Either way, it was good to see Tiger back out in the golf course. Uh, he was hitting the ball well. The flat stick wasn't working so well for him, though, and I think that's where he, if he could have improved anything, I think that's exactly where it would have been. All right, Jerry, the regular season is winding down in the Maritime Hockey League. What can we expect to see closing out, and, and what can we look forward to? Yeah, the Junior A schedule is coming down, Chris. Uh, the final uh, day of the regular se schedule is uh, March 11th. So that's eight to ten games for most teams. And it's really tight in the Northern Division. It looks like Edmonton Blizzard have the first place wrapped up. But they only have a five-point bulge on the uh, Summerside Western Capitals. So it's the Blizzard with 63, uh, the uh, Capitals with 58, then you get the Camelton Tigers with 54, and the hottest team in the MHL, the Miramichi Timberwolves, have 53, just one point back of Campbellton and trying to buy their way up. They've won eight of their last 10. They're four all in one, Chris, in their last five. They've scored 38 goals in their last five games, allowed just 18, so they're scoring 7.6 goals in their last five games. Thus, the individual scoring leader is from the Mary Sheet Timberwolves. His name is Derek Dubé Plouffe, and he's followed by his teammate, Jacob Santer and the Summerside Western Capital Trent Crane. So it's a tight race as Plouffe has a six point lead on both Santer and Trent. And if the Timberwolves keep scoring like they have, Chris, they've got over 210 goals already scored this season. They could vault themselves up in, into maybe second and possibly third in the uh, in the North Division and set themselves up for home ice advantage uh, come the month of March. Uh, XFL, not NFL, Chris, explain the difference. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was week one of the XFL was giving it its second attempt here in the world to see if they can't uh, prove. Start off, of course, with on opening day, The Rock tried to do, you know, what The Rock does. And that is, of course, cut a promo. Although I will say as a Rock fan, right. not his best promo. But overall, there's some really cool things that we got to see. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a couple hits and misses. I'm going to start with this. The hits. I absolutely loved the onside kick. Uh, instead of an onside kick, which apparently the NFL is tampered with too, although it got shut down real quick, they go fourth and 15. If you can convert, if you convert a fourth and 15, you retain possession. You can go down. In fact, I think I saw a team down by 15 with a minute and a half to go come back to win the game, um, which I thought was really neat. Cool idea for them to change it up. The other thing I liked, uh, which I don't think the NFL will ever adapt, is every like it's mic'd up. The OCs are mic'd up. You can hear the play calling. Everything that's happening. Everybody hears what's going on. I don't think that would ever work in the NFL for multiple reasons. Uh, the other thing too would be kickoffs. Um, the thing I loved about kickoffs is that, and, and I'm not sure if you had a chance to watch Jerry, but when the opening kickoff or any kickoff after a touchdown is happening, the lineup starts at about the 30 yard line on the opposing side of things. And that's just yeah. to make sure that people aren't building up momentum and just running through these guys coming up the field with the ball. It's gonna prevent a lot of injuries. Uh, but what I did like about it is that it actually did open up a little more space for the kick returners to come on in. I thought it was great. Now on the misses side, unfortunately, the one thing I didn't like, unfortunately, as us broadcasters, Jerry, we've seen in the past, I think the broadcast booth could use a little help. Uh, again, I'm hoping to see that that's just something that's going to over time tweak and progression. You don't got those big name guys like they do in the NFL. But overall, hey, look, it was week one. I love the fact that the, the XFL has come out. We'll see what happens here at this point. Uh, although there seems to be a lot of people, a lot more people supporting it now than they did before. Look, I hope they can tweak this thing and make it work. Uh, all right, Jerry, big basketball weekend coming up in St. John. Didn't think I'd say that for a while. But either way, like, tell us about the new basketball league. 
Hey, b- basketball's a big sport in New Brunswick, Chris. We don't talk about it enough, but this is a big event. It happens every year. It's called the Final 12. It's the NBIAA's Basketball Championship in AAA and AAA. It gets underway on Friday and continues on Saturday. The A Championship for boys and girls is on Friday night as South Victoria High School is going to take on Harvey High. And Harvey, that's from the girls' side, and Harvey High is also in the final for the A in the boys' side as they take on John Caldwell. The double A is going to be on Saturday afternoon, which you have uh, Woodstock High taking on St. Stephen. And then later on you have, uh, for the boys, North uh, Carlton North rather taking on Miramichi Valley High School boys. And the Miramichi Valley High School girls are in the triple A. I don't know how to answer that, Chris. One's in double A, the boys. The girls are in the triple A. Uh, 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 girls final on Saturday night as they take it on St. Malachy's and of course in the boys it's an all Fredericton matchup as the Fredericton High School takes on Leo Hayes so it starts Friday night it's at TD Station it's always a big affair in St. John the final 12 basketball championships in uh, high school uh, basketball uh, Chris also uh, Mac McClung I'm not sure who he is or where he came from but he had a big impact where well, let me tell you where he had an impact, Jerry. For those who don't know or didn't know his name, they do now. Mac McClung single-handedly could have saved the slam dunk contest in the NBA. It was starting to get old. It was starting to get redundant. Shaquille O'Neal said, you know, first of all, I laughed because Shaq told him, look, nobody knows your name. Don't screw up a dunk. But at the end of the day, he saved the ding. McClung is a YouTube sensation. His final senior year mixtape had over 3 million views on YouTube. Um, you know, and to see how he ran his dunk contest, originally he, was, he went on drafted in 2021. Um, you know, joined the Lakers as the summer league, signed with them after that, then moved to the Bulls for a short contract the next year, eventually ended up in the NBA G League with the Bulls affiliate, Windy City. He was invited to the dunk contest this year. He was part of the Delaware Blue Coats for the 2022-2023 season, making him the first G League player to participate in the dunk contest, wins the NBA Slam Dunk Contest, and never played a game in the NBA. I think it's great. That's what they needed. The dunk contest is for the fans. These YouTube street baller guys, this is exactly what they needed. I love to see it. You know, seeing a six foot two white guy dominate the, uh, the the slam dunk contest in the NBA absolutely melted my heart. Loved every minute of it. I thought it was super exciting. And I think it's just something cool that the NBA is done to tweak a little bit to bring all-star games back for the fans. Well, Jerry, that's going to wrap it up. I hope everybody's had as much fun doing the show as we've uh, watched the show as we've had doing it. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.